Thanks, Robin. So medical bionics is all about developing systems that will enable the effective interfacing of the worlds of biology and electronics. Perhaps the most famous example in Australia is the bionic ear, the cochlear ear implant, pioneered by Professor Graham Clark. That implant works by picking up sound from a microphone, transposing that sound into electrical signals, and then stimulating through a series of microelectrodes nerve cells. And so the deaf can hear. There are numerous other examples, like neural stimulators for control of Parkinson's, for control of pain, for control of chronic depression. There's also the area of the bionic eye, where we're developing electrode materials that will be implanted. And you'll hear about this later. And then we will use electrical stimulation. These groups will use electrical stimulation so that the blind can see. So these are amazing examples of medical bionics. So it all comes down to what happens at this interface between the electrodes and living cells. In all of those fascinating applications, this is the critical element. So as we implant an electrode material of a given composition and structure, it will invoke a series of molecular reactions and cellular transitions, which will set up an interface between the electronics and the biology. The structure of that interface will ultimately depend, will ultimately control how we can communicate across that interface, how effective we can transmit electronic signals from the electronic world to the biological world. There's been three significant advances in electrode materials over the past three decades. They've been the discovery of organic conducting polymers, the advent of nanotechnology, and additive fabrication. Organic conducting polymers are often referred to as plastics that conduct electricity. The advent of nanotechnology has enabled us to control the size of matter in the nano domain. That's a thousand times less than the dimensions of a human hair. That specific control over the dimensions of matter means that we have exquisite control over the properties of those electrode materials. And the area of additive fabrication, wherein we create structures from the ground up, rather than chiseling a structure from a block of preformed material, also revolutionizes how we can think about creating devices for medical bionics. Before the advent of organic conducting polymers, the choice available in electrode materials is, was somewhat limited. The electrode engineer was faced with carbons or metals, and usually, and obviously for good reason, they would pick metals that were chemically inert and mechanically robust, so metals like platinum. But of course, it's difficult to control the composition of those metal materials. Uh, we have limited control over the interfacial chemistry and limited control over the mechanical properties. That's not so with organic conducting polymers. Here we have soft materials which conduct electricity. They're actually very effectively can be integrated with biological molecules. And so molecules such as proteins can be integrated into the structure at the point of synthesis. And in fact, even living cells can be integrated into this electronic network at the point of synthesis. And so here we can assemble a structure which is highly biologically active and can conduct electricity. Quite a unique combination of properties in a set of materials. There's further dimensions to these materials that prevent, pre provide further control. It's possible to take those conducting polymer structures and to electrically stimulate them so that in situ, after we've created them, we can further control their properties. For example, controlling the wettability, the ability to interact with liquids or repel those liquids, the ability to release active molecules right at that electrode cellular interface, and the ability to control mechanical properties. Each of these can be induced using electrical stimuli that are biologically appropriate. They do not damage the biological system. There are no other set of materials that provide these dimensions in trying to engineer from the molecular level the electrode cellular interface. It was armed with that information some 10 years ago that I had an encounter with Professor Graham Clark, the pioneer of the cochlear ear implant electrode. Graham is an inspirational person, an inspirational individual. What he has achieved through the cochlear implant has been recorded in many different domains. 
The cochlear implant story is in itself inspirational. Not just about the science and the engineering, but about the vision, about the ability to build the team, and the ability to never say no, and never take no for an answer. So Graham created that vision, and he created what was to be the cochlear ear implant. We have worked with Graham in developing conducting polymer surfaces, which enable us to sustain nerve cell growth, in fact, to promote nerve cell growth through electrical stimulation and through the release of those bioactive molecules that I described just before. In more recent work, we've taken that platform with a view to developing new systems that might assist in nerve regeneration. This ability to interact with nerve cells and now to use microdimensional control with the fibres that we can implant on that structure provides a platform for not only sustaining and controlling nerve growth, but controlling the direction of that growth. And that's quite important if we're talking about nerve regeneration, where we need nerves to reconnect, or we want those nerves to connect to another device, such as a neural prosthetic. This is our most recent work, where we take that fabrication strategies down into the nano domain. With the micro-dimensional fibres, it was good, it works well, but those fibres occupy a lot of space and don't provide much other function. So we would like to reduce the size of the fibres down to the nano domain, a thousand times less, so that we can hopefully still get the same effect but occupy less space. So we've managed to do that. We've developed fabrication strategies to control and to enable us to make nanodimensional fibres or nanodimensional components of conducting polymers that can control the direction of the neuron outgrowth. In doing that, we uncover other ma unusual materials, unusual properties of electromaterials. Even with conventional electromaterial structures, like in a common battery, as we reduce the size from the macroscopic down to the microscopic, this is the dimensions of living cells, and then 1,000 times less than that down into the nano domain, even conventional materials take on extraordinary properties. Their ability to transfer charge is greatly affected. Their ability to transport charge within that nanostructure is greatly enhanced, increasing the conductivity by orders of magnitude. Along with these physical changes, there are molecular and biomolecular changes that make this attractive for using in the area of medical bionics. We do get changes in surface energy, changes in protein adhesion, and changes in cellular interaction simply by controlling the nanotopography. So here we have a group, a new group of materials, organic conducting polymers, where we can control the composition, we can control their properties in situ, and we can enhance that degree of control by using nanotechnology. Let's now turn our attention to fabrication of structures using those materials. In the area of additive fabrication, and there are various pa parallel developments in this area, we can envisage developing printers, for example, that would create three-dimensional structures with our organic conductors, our protein molecules, and even living cells spatially distributed throughout that structure. We've been involved in developing techniques based on extrusion printing or inkjet printing, which allow us to do that. Just recently, we've developed a new ink formulation, a bioink formulation, which is capable of supporting living cells during the printing process. And of course, that can be quite extreme if you're being shot out of an inkjet nozzle uh, and bouncing off a pretty hard surface. But it does support the viability of the cells. In fact, 95% of the cells survive that process in this special formulation. So we can print these cells and we can strategically place them exactly where we want them in our new structure, in our new bionic device. So with all of this combination of advances in this area of medical bionics, or related to this area of medical bionics, we can dare to dream. And we've been involved in a project, or we are involved in a project with Professor Mark Cook, to develop new systems for epilepsy detection and control. This will utilize 
organic conducting materials as an implant directly into the brain, which will pick up signals from the brain, which give warning of an impending seizure. We will then use our polymer structure and the function we can build into it to incorporate anti-epileptic drugs and using the information coming from the brain, transpose that into a reaction which involves localized release of those anti-epileptic drugs exactly where they need it so as they can act swiftly and efficiently in this application. This, of course, is a very bold application, but it's made possible by the advances in materials and science, material science and engineering just over the last three decades. There's no doubt that others can envisage other applications in medical bionics because of these advances in material science. The advances in terms of new materials, organic materials, that conduct electricity and can be highly biologically active, combined with the advances in nanotechnology and these advances in additive fabrication will have a dramatic impact. Implicit in what I've said is the need to build a highly skilled interdisciplinary team to tackle these challenges in medical bionics. Usually those skills are found in a range of personalities. And while I can, with some logic and planning, describe the science to you, perhaps this is the more critical thing, how we build, create, and sustain those teams. And that's much more difficult to plan. But we've been particularly lucky in that we've worked with some of the most significant scientists, engineers, and clinicians of the modern era in our pursuit of medical bionics. And not only are these people well-respected in their field, they are incredibly talented at building multidiscipline research teams. And so we've learned a lot, not just about the science and engineering, but starting with Professor Graham Clark, how to build effective interdisciplinary research teams if we are to transpose or trans translate these advances in material science and engineering into the field of medical bionics. Obviously, we, won't, we will not revolutionize medical bionics simply by advances in material science and engineering. It will require individuals who have a bold vision, who are determined, and who can work together with other individuals to make that a reality. We are determined to work with our colleagues to make sure that the most relevant advances in materials, science and engineering are put to great use, the best use possible in this critical and important area. Thank you.